This week on Arts Insight. Remapping the American dream. There was nothing but this network, this lacy network of transportation networks that would just go through the human body and it was a total revelation to us. A true passion for ballet. This is an experience where it's up close, it's personal, you can smell it, touch it, feel it in a different way that is lost sometimes in the bigger halls. Sculpting metal into underwater instruments. You kind of come up with a name, a fish that somebody knows, and an instrument, and if you can kind of combine them together, it kind of works. And a look at the tales and cocktails behind the golden age of Hollywood. We sort of landed on the idea of Hollywood in drinking, and we kind of grabbed a tiger by the tail. I'm Ernie Manoose, and it's time to get arts in sight. Welcome to Arts Insight. Today, we're visiting the Blaffer Art Museum on the University of Houston campus to learn more about their new exhibition, Slavs and Tartars, Mirrors for Princes. We'll delve into that in just a few minutes. But first, roadmaps used as a vehicle to re-examine the American dream? Two artists are dissecting that concept with painstakingly precise precision. each other working together we started dating working together and we never really divorced that working together and being in a relationship that just continued from the beginning um, so it was constantly collaborative uh, in that way we went and saw a show that was called the bodies exhibit that was touring around the world and it's an ethically enormously problematic uh, human rights atrocity as far as I can tell uh, but in one of those rooms they had the human vascular system and pulmonary system excised from the rest of the body and so there was nothing but this network this lacy network of transportation networks that would just go through the human body and it was a total revelation to us of like oh my god you can look at the human body this way as these conduits and these roadways and so finding that sort of corporeal bodiness of maps felt like a really juicy uh, thing to mine. And it was a learning curve. I mean, when you say trial and error, it's mostly error at first, and then, you know, eventually it gets okay. Um, there's only one time that we've messed up so badly that we had to just throw the map out. It was a, a piece that had text in it. And I just went right through and cut out the positive space and the R, and there's no recovery from that. Like, there's, there's just nothing you can do. Um, so we chucked that one. <laughs> and then over the course of developing these over the next few years, we started to layer graphic images across that and to figure out like what are the images that make our sense of place, that make us like know who we are connected to where we're from. Um, and so that went, you know, to the realm of like suburban iconography, to Western iconography, to a series that used uh, vintage erotica. For the longest time, the only really positive imagery of gay men in the West was in erotica. And so we were using materials from like Bob Miser's uh, work in LA to kind of lay those across these Western landscapes and then cut out everything, leaving that vascular network in there. The piece that's up at Art League, the 50 States Wyoming, uh, in the course of making that piece, we didn't know we were making a Wyoming piece yet. We were making a piece about Western iconography. And, and in the course of that, we stumbled across this 19th century narrative of the Scottish Lord uh, and a party of 100 presumably uh, same-sex attracted men uh, led by William Drummond Stewart and his lover. Before they had even finished surveying the Oregon Trail, there was this band of 100 probably gay men throwing a party on the shores of a lake. It, 
utterly shifts the way that you understand what it means to stand there. It, it's, a, it's a paradigm shift in your experience of the land um, and your sense of agency and your sense of belonging. Uh, so over the course of 2014 and 2015, Nick and I retraced their journey from St. Louis up to Wyoming uh, with these microcrystalline wax panels covering queered cowboy iconography. And we'd stop at 80 mile intervals along the way, cover them with a soil sample and then drive over that with a truck, leaving our uh, kind of imprint of our record along their journey along this pilgrimage. These narratives have to be shaping how we understand our place in the world. And we have to use our power as artists to take it and to amplify these histories as much as we can, uh, because otherwise other people get to dominate uh, the, the narratives that we understand ourselves with. And I don't want that. I don't want other kids to have to grow up not having these images to, to understand themselves in. You can learn more at nickandjakestudio.com. Now, as we mentioned earlier, the Blaffer Art Museum was honored to be chosen as the final and only U.S. stop for the exhibit Slavs and Tartars, Mirrors and Princess. Here to tell us more is Slav and Tartar co-founder, Payam. Hello there. Hello. So tell me a little bit about the idea behind this exhibit. The exhibition looks at uh, a certain type of medieval advice literature called Mirrors for Princes, which was basically the first attempt to put secular scholarship on the same level as religious scholarship in medieval times, the 10th and 13th centuries. And what we thought was interesting is if a millennium later, everybody and their grandmother is a kind of political expert. You have CNN, I reporter, blogosphere, and Twitter, and yet you have a very, very few kind of eloquent, intelligent discourses on the role of faith in public life. When we take a walk through the gallery here, what are we going to encounter? There's a series of installations and sculptures that look at the idea of, la of language as a form of etiquette and a form of sort of self-presentation and the kind of the, the rules and, and regulations that govern our language and the way we speak, but also certain instruments, uh, grooming, and how grooming is actually a, another form of self-presentation and how we present ourselves to the outside world, how we, not only grooming in terms of how we raise the next generation, but also literally grooming as in grooming your hair, your eyelashes, your eyebrows, and uh, your facial hair. When you look at what you're putting out here, I wonder from a curating point of view, when we talk of art, are we talking about the object or the idea behind it? And for you, where does it balance? Successful art actually asks more questions than it answers, in a sense. And so the, a, a piece that happens to engage certain ideas and engage people in, in thinking about those ideas is really the, the aim. It, there's no specific idea or ideology or, or narrative per se, but it's really about asking certain questions about the role of the state and, and the religion, the role of, for example, of language politics, um, the role of political discourse, uh, the role of the public sphere. I'm fascinated when you first walk in, the first exhibit we see has, or here I should actually say, is that you have all these voices speaking at once over each other. Can you talk a little about that? Yeah, so the main installation, the main piece of this Mirrors for Princes is a piece called Lector, and it's essentially six-channel audio. It's an excerpt from a 12th century Turkic Mirror for Prince called The Wisdom of Royal Glory, and it's an excerpt about language and how the tongue can elevate you to the highest office or it can condemn you to the lowest sort of depths of misery. And the excerpt is originally in Uyghur, kind of a Western Turkic language, and then it's sort of in a domino effect, kind of uh, voiceover translation into all the languages of the venues where this piece has been shown. So it goes from Uyghur, a Turkic language, next to Polish, where it was shown in, uh, a year and a half ago, then to German, because it was shown in Leipzig, and then Zurich, next to Arabic, because it was shown in Abu Dhabi, then to Gaelic, because it was shown in Edinburgh, and finally in Spanish for this venue here in Houston. And what's interesting to me is you were saying you didn't pick the primary language of each of these locations. Well, actually, we chose in the last three locations because English is a primary language, we chose the, uh, the other language. So in Edinburgh, we chose Gaelic, and here we chose Spanish um, for many reasons. One is that English, of course, is a lingua franca, sort of a global language, but often it becomes a kind of a, a transactional language, sort of just about getting yourself understood. And for us, the, the, the challenge is how do we think about language as a kind of metaphysical as a sacred, as a non-rational form of, uh, of uh, phenomenon of some sort. Another aspect of the piece is up on the wall, shrouded in neon. And tell me a little about that part of it. So 
I mean, the advice literature, of course, assumes that we will achieve our goals and sort of we can always, it's a kind of, there's a, there's a progressive idea that we will always make some kind of progress moving forward. And on the other side, there's, of course, defeatism, meaning that no matter how hard we try, as Samuel Beckett would say, sort of fail, fail once, try again, fail better. And this piece sort of pokes fun at that uh, positivism of, uh, or optimism of advice literature. And it's an aphorism or a, a statement on it that says, it is of utmost importance that we repeat our mistakes as a reminder to future generations of the depths of our stupidity. Well, there is nothing stupid about this exhibit. Quite fascinating and a very interesting way to look at our world and where we've come from. And thank you very much for this. Thank you. If people want to find out more about what's going on here at the Blaffer Gallery, they can always go to blafferartmuseum.org. Next, for over 40 years, the Nevada Ballet Theater has been bringing classical ballet to the Las Vegas community. In their studio series, the audience experiences intimate performances and gets to interact with the dancers. to a song, seen a movie, gone to an art museum, listened to a concert, seen an opera, and been emotionally attacked. For a moment, you pause and you feel something that's inside. Ballet is that as well. If you want to see ballet, which is the most difficult, the purest form of dance, and where most dancers start, we have it here for you. Nevada Ballet Theater has been in existence since 1972. We have our studio series. It's a, a benefit that is for subscribers only. They get to talk to the dancers. The dancers create the work. They ask questions. There's interaction. This is an experience where it's up close. It's personal. You can smell it, touch it, feel it in a different way that is lost sometimes in the bigger halls. I started it a long time ago. Wanting to see and hear from the artists that are in your organization, who influences them choreographically, what type of music inspires them, and at the same time, dancers get so desolate and fearful at the ends of their career because they haven't had any other opportunities within their career other than taking class, learning ballets, and teaching. So if they haven't had the opportunity to teach, I can at least give them an opportunity to choreograph. So I gave them the outline of the music and I said I wanted two women to choreograph for two men, two men for two women. So they, they start mixing things up. I thought they did a great job. I especially liked Braden Barnes' piece. He called it a nothing and that was based off of some jump in motocross that the, they do where they let go. I, I think for me, when you, you looked at his piece, he used Rachmaninoff music. He used a small group of dancers, it was five, and it told a story. It was very subtle. The subtlety of it may not read on a big stage, but it worked for that studio series very well. The surprise for me was Amy von Horndorf's piece because she had never choreographed Pas de Deux before and I asked her why and she said she was afraid to. I said, well, why are you afraid? She goes, because I don't know what men do. I said, well, you're talking to a man who's choreographed for women and I, I don't know what women feel like on those point shoes, so it's a two-way street here. I said, give it a go. I was fascinated knowing that Nevada Valley Theater has been here for almost 45 years now and that that is also testament to this community and longevity. You have music, you have dance, you have the visual arts. We're developing all of that in Las Vegas now. For a young town, it's the beginning of a tradition and it's for the whole family, which is, is special because Las Vegas, you know, is a gaming town. And now that we have a community of almost 2.1 million people, 
this should be part of that. There's a lot of people who live here and work here and are committed to this community. And I think most of this country doesn't view Las Vegas as that. And I'm here to, to, to beg to differ because I've seen the communities. What do I love about the ballet and what keeps me going? Seeing the, the beautiful young people work and they work so hard. It's for the love of it, really. And their career is like an athlete. They last maybe till they're in their 30s. And if you see the rigorous training they have to go through to do it right, to be a professional, you see what a love of the art form it is. And they do love it. That's why they do it. And I think that's always uh, an inspiration to me. The most satisfying aspect of what I do has to do with when you introduce dance, and it's usually the vehicle of the Nutcracker, and kids who walk into the theater for the very first time and look and go, wow. Because to me, it's become relevant instantly. And when you watch a kid's reaction, you know you've done your job for the next generation, because they're going to take that forward. For more information, visit nevadaballet.org. Moving right along, in the southern Florida Keys, one artist combines fire and metal to create sculptures inspired by the wilderness surrounding his home. A little more than 25 years ago or so, they, were, they had an art class down at the college. It was a metal arts. My mom gave it to me for a birthday. She said, uh, go down, do whatever you want, I want a fountain. And it just kind of took off from there. The fountains drove me to making different types of leaves, and then the fountains also started with bugs. So there's grasshoppers, praying mantis, snails, birds, and other creatures like that. I really like making the marine life. So I do a barracuda, I do flying fish. I've started with now making wahoos. It's just almost anything I happen to like. So if you're going to make a fish, this is, happens to be a different type of fish, but it's still a fish. You can see that it's been cut out. It's cut out with these hand tools right here. It has some little marks on it so I know where fins and pieces go. The first thing you have to do is anneal the piece. I'm going to start out by just running around with the heat into the water, out. And what you now have is a piece of metal that's just a little flexible. I don't want to do that too much. Now it's ready to be hammered. What you want to do is you start working around the piece. All the way around. All right, you can see that it's kind of domed up a little bit. Um, the next process, you have to go back and kind of flatten it out. You have to make the body first, and then you make the head afterwards so it, it, it kind of fits it. Get it all squeezed down. Looks pretty good. It's all set. I'm going to set them down. It doesn't take very much to get them together, but what I'm going to be doing now is getting the body hot and the head hot at the same point. And when it gets all silvery and watery like that, you know it's it's there. It's, it's never coming off. For the texture on the coral, what I'm doing is I use a silver braze, and you have to bring the temperature up of the copper to a certain point where the silver will melt, so it kind of sticks and it's on there, but it's still in that little molten ball. To get the just the patina on a copper, which is kind of that greenish blue look, I use pool acid, and you put it on the piece. You've got to be really careful with it. You let it sit for however long, and then you can rinse it off, and then you use household ammonia. And you come back in an hour, and whatever's going to change has changed, and what isn't, there's nothing you can do about it. On the instrument, Lower Keys Chamber of Commerce put out a piece that they were looking for some artists to make an underwater musical instrument, uh, kind of fishy inspired. I had pieces of mine above me, and I happened to look up, and there's a French angel above me, and I looked up and it went, oh, French horn. That was it. And it's the sitar fish, the conch horn. 
So I started figuring out how to do it. You kind of come up with a name, a fish that somebody knows, and an instrument, and if you can kind of combine them together, it kind of works. Every time I make it, I go, you know, I'm going to make a really good one and keep it. I do keep some of the pieces and stuff like that. But it's always a challenge to me to make it better. Find out more by visiting artistsinparadise.com. And finally tonight, a writer and filmmaker ventures back in time to Hollywood's famed hangouts, sharing true tales of celebrity antics served up with rounds upon rounds of cocktails. Nothing like sitting at a bar to inspire a book or two about drinking drinks and the drinkers. Good Friends writer Mark Bailey and illustrator Edward Hemingway, grandson of Ernest no less, did just that. And nothing like an old Hollywood hangout is the perfect place to tell tall tales and talk cocktails. We were in New York at a Christmas party at a, you know, sitting at a bar actually, and, and, and we were talking about kind of the good old days when writers really knocked it back. And uh, his grandfather among them and others, Fitzgerald and Faulkner and O'Neill. And so out of that sort of sprang the idea of doing a book on hard drinking American writers. So we did that book, and it came out, and uh, was a lot of fun, and people seemed to enjoy it. And then we wanted to follow it up with something, and so we were kind of casting about for ideas. And I had, I, as you noted, I was a screenwriter, and I'm a screenwriter, and I'd moved out to Los Angeles at this point. And so we sort of landed on the idea of Hollywood in drinking. And we kind of grabbed a tiger by the tail. With as many memories as this place, of all the gin joints packs in the Hollywood lore, including other landmarks and their contributions to high spirits everywhere. The Cock and Bull, which was on Sunset, that they invented the Moscow Mule, and that, you know, and that has kind of come back into currency. I mean, you see the Moscow Mule a lot um, now on, on cocktail menus all over the place. And the story of that, of the invention of the Moscow Mule, was that that the 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 owner of um, the cock and bull was producing his own ginger beer, which is a key ingredient, and he was kind of stuck with a bunch of ginger beer that was going to go bad, and then he had a couple of extra cases of Smirnoff, and so he mixed the two, which is essentially what the Moscow Mule is: ginger beer and vodka and some lime, and he served it up in this ice cold copper mug, which is really great if you can get your hands on those copper mugs, make it really nice, and. There was a guy who, uh, who was there at the bar, an actor, a great character actor named Broderick Crawford, who used to, Broderick Crawford's favorite place to hang out was here, the Formosa. But, um, but he was, he was, he was that, that night at um, the Cock and Bull, and he was the first one to try the Moscow Mule, and he said it tasted good. It had a little kick to it. And so that's how the, you know, and then the, the name was born, the Moscow Mule, the drink with the velvet kick. Which leads us to another story involving a couple more gin joints, including the Formosa, and the infamous cast of Stanley Kramer's Not as a Stranger. And it started at Villa Capri, where a bunch of them are hanging out there. Um, uh, uh, Mitchum and, oh, and Lee Marvin as well, I believe. Uh, Mitchum and, and, and Sinatra and Lee Marvin are hanging out at Villa Capri, and jo Joe DiMaggio is there. And DiMaggio sort of is drowning his sorrows at the bar, right? He's, he's on the outs with Marilyn. Their marriage is falling apart, and he just wants to find Marilyn and talk to her and try and convince her, right? So, so he, he, and Sinatra's a pal of DiMaggio, so they're talking about that Sinatra says that he happens to know where Marilyn is, where she's staying, you know, that very evening. And so they hatch this plan, which later the newspapers would call the wrong door raid, and they, that they're going to go and they're going to find Marilyn at this apartment and they're going to they're going to knock the door down and they're going to give DiMaggio a chance to you know confront her and talk to her. So okay, you got to imagine there's a lot of booze that's going down as they're hatching this little plan. So then they're trying to figure out well who's big enough to knock the door down. <laughs> and so they look to Mitchum and Mitch is a big guy, and Mitchum says you know he doesn't know that he can do it, but they they figure well Broad Crawford can do it. Broad was even bigger than Mitchum. So Broderick, they're like, oh, he's going to be hanging out at the Formosa. So they all get in the car and they go and they pick, a, they go to the, come here to the Formosa, they pick up Broad Crawford and then they go to the apartment. And, you know, the way it went down is basically Crawford goes up and he 
boom, hammers the door and busts it down just like he's supposed to. And like these five of the you know, biggest movie stars in the world go stumbling into this apartment. Well, Sinatra had gotten the apartment wrong. And, um, you know, it's this old woman whose name was like Florence Coates. And she's this, you know, six-year-old woman who freaks out. I, you know, I don't know what she's thinking. She has six movie stars knock down her door and got her five movie and trample into the room. So, um, but that Marilyn was actually staying next door. Story upon story. Some fun, some tragic, and some cautionary? A story I like involves William Holden, who's in the book. And the story is, is that uh, William Holden is, uh, he was pals with an actor that folks may remember named Dana Andrews, and with another actor who folks definitely will remember named Ronald Reagan. And the three of them were at a Screen Actors Guild meeting, and uh, after the meeting ended, they decided to go across the street and have dinner. And so they go across the street, and they order a round of drinks, and they all sit down and they start talking. And, you know, after about 10 minutes or so, the waiter comes back, and he asks them if they'd like another round. And um, William Holden says, sure. And Dana Andrews says, sure. And Reagan looks at the two of them and says, you know, why are you ordering another drink? You just had one. And so years later, Dana Andrews would look back on the incident and point out, and see what happened? Bill and I became a couple of alcoholics, and Ronnie went on to become the president of the United States of America. <laughs> and so um, one way to think of this book is that this book is really about the people that ordered that second drink and the third drink and, you know, didn't, didn't really stop there. So um, it's been a lot of fun. Find out more about Mark Bailey at markbaileywriter.com. And there you have it. That does it for another episode of Arts Insight. Join us next time for more stories and profiles of art and artists that spark the imagination and give us all food for thought. For Houston Public Media, I'm Ernie Manoos. Thanks for watching and have a great week.